Okay. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. One of the things just about identity is we often use that term around here to kind of describe a certain teaching or a certain mindset. Um, and then when we talk about it, we also talk about faith. So the, just the first place I want to talk to you guys about is uh, faith and um, what it actually is. Faith isn't this, this thing that's actually separated from God that's just solely inside of you. Faith is a relationship with God. Okay? And what I mean by that, it's like um, you can't have faith that God's going to give you a lot of money unless you have relationship with God and with God you've been talking to him and he's been talking to you and he's revealed certain scriptures to you and you believe that God wants to do something in your life financially. Do you guys see the difference there? The one is 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 self and you're just trying to think really hard and say, oh, I really, I really believe. But the word believe actually in the in the greek means believe trust and faith and those are a relational concept that you actually need somebody else to participate with right so if i was here and my mom's here and um there's a certain level of trust i have for my mom here in this front row right hey <laughs> and um but it's on camera <laughs> that's why i wait <laughs> And with my mom here, I have experiences with my mom. Um, I know that if I say, hey, can you watch Brecken? The answer is most likely yes, right? So I have a lot of faith that my mom likes to take care of her. Does that make sense? But it's because I have experience with her, and it's because I know her heart. And I know her heart is for my, my son. Does that make sense? But I could call her, and if I didn't know that, I'd be kind of like, I don't know if she's really going to take care of my son. But it's not me hoping that she does in the sense where I'm disconnected from her, I don't know her, she's just sort of this person, and well, let's just call and find out. And I think that's what a lot of times people call faith. Let's just wait and see. It's not waiting and seeing, it's getting to know who God is and getting to trust him so that you know what his will is in your life. My mom's will is that she be with Brecken as much as possible. Is that true? Oh, yeah. she, she was with him this morning. Yeah. All night. All night. <laughs> so, um, so do you guys see how it's relational? And it's not, it's not like I'm separated just kind of thinking or maybe let's, let's find out. It's, it's very much a relational thing. That's what faith is. And uh, biblically it says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That conviction, and it is a conviction, comes from a relationship with God. That's where the conviction comes from. I'll read on. This is uh, right there on the, the first page. It says, For by it men of old gained approval. By faith we understand what the worlds were pre prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. The reason why men of old gained approval. Do we have some fathers in here? When your children trust you, more so than their experiences, and they believe you more so than what they're going through. That brings much approval from a father. For example, Todd, you've got two girls, and let's say you know Maddie is going through some hard times, and let's say she's having, uh, let's just say she's having heart trouble, and you say it's not a big deal, right? But it feels like a big deal to her, and she wipes her tears and says, you know what, it feels like a big deal, but I'm trusting you as my dad that it isn't, and she pulls herself out, that would do something. Do you guys get that? So trust, that, that whole trusting thing and faith in your life, it will be reflected. And when it reflects well, he, he approves of it and he likes it a lot. Okay, when Brecken listens to me and he trusts what I'm saying, even though um, the kid loves candy and he wants candy all the time, and I say, listen, this hasn't happened yet. I have to make this up. I say, listen, it's not good that you eat candy. Like, you need to eat carrots and you need to eat celery. He says, Dad, you know what? I really like candy, but man, I'm trusting you right now. Eating this carrots and celery. That hasn't happened, but that'd be cool. It would do something for me if you did that. In a good way. Um, so there, there's certain scriptures that actually in the Bible, how many of you guys know that just because the Bible says something and just because it's true doesn't necessarily mean that you get to take advantage of it? It's not, it's not automatic in the sense where um, my wife could love me and that be true, but I never take advantage of the fact that she loves me because I didn't know or because I didn't believe it. Okay, and what I mean by that, it's like going back to just my mom sitting here. My mom could want to be with Brecken, 
want to take care of Brecken and just love on that kid, but I am end up calling a different babysitter because I just didn't know that that was her heart. Does that make sense? And so there's certain things that are said in the Gospels about you that you might not take advantage of because you just didn't see it that way. How many of you guys have ever read the Bible and it just seems like poetry sometimes and very flowery and you don't know what to do with the scripture, but it actually means what it says and there's a certain advantage that you can take from what the scripture is saying. There are scriptures that emphasize what it is that you have now become. And if you look at 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says this. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Now that's, that's, that sounds great, doesn't it? This is actually what it's saying. It's saying that the sin that is in your life, right, he put on Christ. And since he took that sin and put it on Christ, that sin and that nature of it no longer hangs on you. Now, that's pretty exciting, which means that you could probably go to him confidently knowing that, that, that who you were is no longer who you are, but now you're something new. But you might not approach him boldly because you don't feel new. And because you don't feel new, you don't feel like getting along with God. You guys get what I'm saying? So there's a certain advantage to take from what Scripture is saying now that you've become new creations. Um, go to the next one. It says, what I've been rescued from in Colossians 1, 13 and 21. It says this, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. Now, how many of you guys know that you could be a Christian, be engaged in evil deeds, still have hostile thoughts, and have that completely ravage you? Meanwhile, you've been rescued from that, but you're not taking advantage of the rescue because you're falling for the thoughts and you're looking at your life and what you're doing and you're believing that what you're doing is who you are. Meanwhile, this has pretty much told you your location. He's rescued you from the domain of darkness. So whenever you feel like even like you're in darkness and something's wrong and you're not acting the way you should and thoughts you're having aren't godly, you can be sitting there and all of a sudden you can say, God, I thank you. I've been rescued from this thing. I'm experiencing it right now. It doesn't feel good and I don't feel holy and I don't feel pure and I don't feel blameless, but that doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, is this is what the Bible says. This is what's true about me. And I thank you that that's not what's true about me. And even though I, I, I feel like crud right now, it doesn't matter. What, what, and the, just because I don't have the fruits of the Spirit, just because I'm not feeling the fruits of the Spirit, doesn't mean that I don't have them. Just because I don't have peace doesn't mean that peace is in me. I thank you that it is. And I thank you that it doesn't matter what's going on right now in my life. The most important thing is that you love me and you died. And you can just keep speaking the promises of what he said over. And I can promise you, um, you'll be in a much better place even if you were having a good day. You'll be having a great day because you just fellowshiped with your father over his realities. And that's the important of this. It's the, these realities that have been spoken in scripture. We're not taking advantage of. We're letting the day happen to us. Instead of standing firm with the shield of faith saying, no, that's not the way it's going to be. This is what it says. My feelings don't matter to me as much as his word and what it says. Does that make sense to you guys? It will. We're just getting saved. It says, who I am now in Christ, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's amazing. The I have been crucified. This this thing that needed to be gratified, this thing that, that needed something from somebody. So let's just say, hey guys, there's more seats. You gotta sit next to somebody though. And if hey, Carrie, did you kill the heat? You got enough heaters in here. Thank you. I'm just going to just put this in the, in the topic of marriage real quick. If I'm married and, and I have been crucified, that's a good marriage. You guys get what I'm saying? If I have been crucified, now, you, you might some days feel like you haven't been, and you might feel like you wish your spouse would do this for you because if my spouse would do this for me, well, then maybe it would make me feel this way, and then if I felt this way, then everything would be okay. Everything wouldn't be okay. Your spouse is never, gonna, never going to be perfect in the sense where they execute every day to meet your needs. The problem is, is that you still believe that you have needs, and these needs actually control you and guide you, and, and, and if someone doesn't treat you or say certain things and that upsets you, that's not freedom, that's bondage, right? 
So when I look at this uh, and I say uh, that I have been crucified with Christ, there's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. When I when I look at that, that just crushes all needs for me. Which means that if, if someone doesn't treat me poorly, or if my wow, my, my wow, that's what I call my wife. My wow. <laughs> yeah, right? If my wow um, is, is, is having a bad day, it doesn't mean that I have a bad day. And it's not because I'm cold towards her. It's because I don't need her in a certain mood for me to be in a certain mood. If anything, I want to pick her up, right? She's my wow. So. <laughs> This next verse here, it says, My new nature consists of, <coughs> Colossians 1, 22 through 23 uh, says this, Yet he has now reconciled you, uh, I just, yeah, I, he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him uh, holy and blameless uh, and beyond uh, reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast. This is what's amazing to me. How many of you guys, um, have ever had a thought, or ever had a circumstance, or ever um, had something fly into your mouth, and you didn't necessarily feel wholly pure and blameless. <laughs> if you're born again, you are involved in a process in which you become wholly pure and blameless. Now you and the Holy Spirit are working on your behavior. Do you guys get what I'm saying when I say that? You and the Holy Spirit are now transforming your mind, and your behavior is becoming more holy, pure, and blameless. Now this is, this is what's so amazing. In the midst of, has anybody ever um, really messed up in your life you looked up to? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, still laughing about my, my watch. Um, what ends up happening is, uh, is we look at people and, and, and somebody screws up. And the problem wasn't that the sin was too tough. The problem wasn't circumstance. The problem was is that they didn't believe this last verse that I just read. The problem is they didn't believe that they were holy, pure, and blameless. Do you guys get what I'm saying? When you believe that you are that, it, it doesn't leave room for those big mess-ups in your life. The problem is, is that you weren't seeing yourself correctly. The problem was, is when temptation came, you didn't know if you were a sinner or a saint. And you were still kind of confused. And you didn't stand firm on the fact that you're a saint, holy, pure, and blameless. And you opened yourself up to the idea that maybe you're not that, but you're something else. But the Bible's very clear on what you are. Okay, is there anybody in here, let's just take a moment, can you guys just partner up with somebody, just find somebody, partner up with them, this is what I want you to share, is there one thing that in this class, in this identity class that you're hoping will kind of help you along with, and what I mean by that is, is there anybody in here who, who has a certain behavior that they know if they believe the gospel more, if they knew if they believe this identity message more, it wouldn't be there. Or maybe there's still something that gets under your skin. Or maybe there's still something that you feel like you need. Do you guys get what I'm saying? And who wants to uh, share? Who knows that? Who knows Christ enough that they have the willingness to share? Go ahead. Uh, where I struggle most is uh, driving. Okay. And that's where, that's where like, uh, my struggles really come out. Because I feel like people should do it better. Amen. <laughs> chat against my driving abilities. Yes. My mine is also the same. I was thinking on the drive in here how irritated I was that people actually do the speed limit. <laughs> <laughs> and I recognized how foolish it was to be upset because someone's actually obeying the law. Yeah. I always took the sign as a suggestion. <laughs> but I, I realized today, that's the one I marked low because I've just experienced it today. Yeah. At work, I struggle with, uh, and I bring it home, and I struggle with the fact that you, uh, uh, the way things are, the way they go there, uh, people tend to blame especially myself and what I do in particular, yeah. things that I actually am not responsible for. Yeah. And that it kind of rubs me a little bit, and then I tend to bring it home. Uh, and that's not yeah. fair to Linda. And, it's, and one of the things is, is like, this is the difference between the identity message and like Christianity in general. You might say, what's the difference between the two? Um, there, is, there is one. The, the majority of Christians would come up to them and say, they'd say, thanks for confessing, brother. That's good. <laughs> But they wouldn't get. They wouldn't have an expectation for it. The expectation is is confession, not change your life because that's not who you are. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. 
And so there's, there's, a, there's a difference there when it comes to how do you counsel people in identity. It's not, man, it's, that, must be, that must be rough. Thank God you confess that and then walk away. Or, like, it's, it's just different because you call somebody up out of to a higher, a higher standard. Anybody else? Mine's similar to Steve's, only it's not driving. It just has to do with work. When work. other people are not performing their <laughs> jobs mm -hmm. to my standard. <laughs> it's the same. Yeah. It's the same. And then I get frustrated. And that's... Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, I think it's okay to have a standard for somebody else. But the moment it, you go home and it's still impacting you, yeah. there's something, something's going on there. Anybody else? Yes. So just, um, mine's kind of a general one, but, you know, I, when I look at the test and in my head, I know these things are true, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I do them, I get them. Don't expect things from people. Don't expect to always be loved. Don't expect to be always understood and all mm -hmm. that. And I think I'm good. And then one time out of nowhere, it just hits. And then you think none of it's real, mm -hmm. you know, and it tends to yeah. throw you for a loop and you just go, I should just be different, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because... It's not, and this is, this is the, I, I can't stress this enough. We're not talking about a level of maturity. You, you know what I mean? You're not going to cross an identity line and never not have a bad moment. You, you guys get what I'm saying? It's possible, but it's a, since it's relational, guess what it depends on? The relationship. Yeah, so it's not, it's not like I'm now going to try harder and, and I'm going to be better at identity. It's not that. It's I'm going to get with God. And me and God are going to get together, and I'm going to understand this thing more. Because there's something I'm still expecting from somebody in which I need to expect it from him. If I still need to be affirmed, I, I need, here's something. Go, try to, go get affirmed from God. I'm sure it'll satisfy you much more than somebody else. You guys get what I'm saying? There's something so much more real about it. So you're not coming in here to learn something, to apply it, so that you'll behave differently. I'm, we're coming in here... And I'm going to tell you what's available, and you're going to get hungry enough for it and go to God and get it. Does that make sense? Because it, it's relational. And without the relationship, you're going to, we needlessly suffer a lot. You know, and like I was talking about 2015. 2015 is going to be a breeze, or you're going to be crushed. And it all depends on where the relationship is in, in the midst of that. And if you need people to treat you in a certain way, yikes. That, that's, that's, a, that's a life sentence, you know? Could you imagine? I, I can't imagine because I'm sure all of us had this, like either you know, growing up or, or what? Do you remember when you used to trust your heart to a bunch of finicky middle schoolers <laughs> on what they thought of you? I could you imagine that? Like that's so that's so imbalanced. That's so there's there's safety there. Oh my goodness, it's a jungle, you know. But that that you would you would think that you, based on how these kids see you. That's how your day's going to go. And I, I believe that's probably pretty much mostly everybody's story. You know? I can't think of a, a, a more dangerous environment than, than the public opinion of a bunch of people whose brains aren't developed even close to being developed yet. You know? And then we take that, those issues we had, and put that on God and say, God, if you're real, then why didn't they treat me better? You know, when he's treated us very well. Anybody else? <clears throat> Want to share? Yes. Um, I, have a lot of I have a hard time with extended family members. Okay. You know, holiday season comes. You're the only person. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I got this. I can handle this. And then sometimes I, I feel like I let my guard down. Mm -hmm. And like something will get said. And I'm <laughs> yeah. I like things like that get to me. You yeah. know, things people say sometimes with family. family, family so. Yeah. No, thank you for sharing. That's very real. Anybody else have that? A little bit? Family? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, what I don't what I don't think we it's not it's not the Holy you are participating with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit isn't putting a collar on you and dragging you into all truth. You guys get what I'm saying? If you don't show up for class with the Holy Spirit, you you will not be shown truth, okay? And you can't show up to this class 
and have truth revealed to you mentally and then somehow in your own power work it out. If you don't show up for Holy Spirit class, you don't get to know all truth. And all truth is going to benefit you. It really is. And I, and I believe that, that um, God is raising the stakes in relationship with him. He doesn't, he doesn't lower the bar. It, 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 he raises the bar. So the longer you're in relationship with him, the more you keep showing up, the more that he keeps showing you what you can be and where you're currently at. You guys get what I'm saying? And, and so it's, it's, it's never not exciting. There's never not any, like, the growth doesn't get stale with God because the Holy Spirit will bring you more and more and more into his likeness. Does that make sense? But this is what we're not doing. We're not, this is where humility comes in. And humility is so key. People are afraid when they hear the identity message because they don't think, they, they don't, they think it's prideful and they think it's like, oh, well, you don't have to, like, worry. You're probably going to screw up because you're going to take advantage of God's grace. Here's the thing about the identity message. The standard for me is Christ. It takes a lot of humility to look at your life and to keep allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and say, what's next? What's next? Help me. Help me. What's next? Okay, yeah, we did that. Oh, my gosh. I finally saw some fruit of that. You know what I mean? I no longer need that from that person. I, I, I no, longer, no longer desire this. I desire you. What's next? And you just keep in process with God, and he really brings you into it. But where we get stuck, and I think this is, this is where you can get stuck, is you can say, I know identity. I know who I am in Christ. That is equal in proportion to the Christ that you live. And we want to be careful with that, because the Bible calls that hypocrisy. You know, when I say things like this, there, there are some scripture verses that I believe. Because uh, what, why? Why do I say it like that? Because my life aligns with it that way. There are some scriptures that are lived out in my life. There are more scriptures I'm trying to live, live out in relationship with God. Make sense? But when we make blanket statements, well, I, 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 I believe everything the Bible says. Equivalent to what? You must live exactly the way Christ is to make such a bold statement. Now, do I believe everything the Bible is true? Absolutely. And I'm trying to believe it. And that's, that's where the battleground is. In relationship with God, God is getting me to believe something, getting, getting me to change my mind about what I was believing. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Ephesians 2.5, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Mm -hmm. um, when I, when I meet with God and I fellowship over these realities, um, th there's a, just a small story in here I just want to just show you. It's John 6, 24, 30. It says, so when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into small boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate no the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which <coughs> endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Do you guys see that? That belief... That's, that is the first step. The first step is always to get with and be with God. And ever, his will in your life will flow out of that. <coughs> because that's what has to drive you and be at the center. But now listen to what it says here. What then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? What did he just get done doing? Doing the work. He just got done doing the work. He just fed them. How about feeding 5,000 people? How's that for a sign? They... They're not in relationship with them, therefore they can't even see plainly what's in front of them. You guys get what I'm saying? Have you ever wished that somebody would see the fruit in your life? Take family members, for example, right? Um, let's, say you're, let's, let's say that like, you live differently than other people, and, and you're, you're, not, you're not floundering, you're always showing up the same person. But there's certain people who you want to have Jesus in their life and they're not recognizing the fact that you do show up the same. In fact, they're still finding issue with you. Has that ever happened? Yeah. <laughs> because they're, they say that they see and they're, they're blind. You, you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There's something that can, is, is seen in Christ. I'm not saying it's fruitless, so don't try. 
what I'm saying is oftentimes people are blind because of their lack of relationship with God. And, and the most important thing that we can do to do the work of God is believe, is to get with God, and all of your life will flow out of that. And I don't have, I don't have expectations for people who aren't Christian. I don't have any. I expect for them to uh, hate me and despise me. And if they don't, that's a good day, right? You, you know? But I, I don't have expectations for people who, aren't, who don't know Christ to, to act a certain way. I have very high expectations for Christians. For as Christians, these aren't promises, they're realities. And whether or not you take advantage of these realities is completely up to you. For example, how many of you guys um, have ever seen anybody get healed or been healed yourself? Have you guys ever seen that? Did you know that there was a time in my life where I never got healed? I mean, slowly over time, the scab would come. But I never got healed instantly because, or I never got to take advantage of that, or I saw sick people and I never prayed for them because I did not believe that God could do that. Right? But now there's something, there's something in Scripture that, that, that the Holy Spirit has shown me, and there's something that I, now I see, that if it says it in the Bible, it must be true for today. And so God and I have done something. How many of you guys, I, I was, there was a time before I was baptized in the Spirit. And every time I came across the whole baptism in the Spirit thing, I had a, here's, here's what's upsetting. I had people explain to me what the baptism of the Spirit was, and it wasn't it, to explain it. And they would explain it as, well, that's, that's just something that happens when you receive Christ. It hadn't happened. I didn't even get to experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit because somebody else explained it away. And I believe that person, <coughs> rather than the Bible, because that person wore a, um, a robe and preached from a pulpit rather than me getting along with God and going to God and saying, will you please explain this to me? Amen. Because when I read this, it says certain things. And when they say that, it doesn't align with this. <laughs> so you can, actually, you can actually believe a person more so than what God has already said, and you could totally miss out on a lot of benefits in Christ. Right? And there are a lot of benefits. And then you can, you can end up asking why things aren't going the way they're supposed to be going. Meanwhile, he's already said it, waiting for you to come to him and, and fellowship over it. Um, I'll bring this up. Uh, I'll bring it up again. When, when I was in my darkest time, I needed identity more than anything, but nobody had it. Nobody had it. And so nobody could, nobody could share it. And I was so angry at God that he probably would have shared it with me. But I was only allowing God so much. You guys get what I'm saying? You guys ever been upset with God because of circumstances in your life? And so you only fellowship with him so much? People, when I was in my lowest point, people came with advice that shaped and molded the next 10 years of my life. Okay? And the things that they said to me were things like this. Um, did you guys ever hear this saying? Um, you've been cut deep. It'll heal, but you'll always have the wound. Did you ever hear something like that? That is probably the most unbiblical thing I have ever heard in my entire life. It's actually a mindset to get people set up to stay justified in their feelings so that they remain in it. And they don't know about identity. They don't know any of this stuff. So now they're stuck feeling hurt, feeling justified because the counselor with the degree told them that they'd always have a wound. So now they feel justified to act the way that they're acting because they feel like they're still deserve something from somebody they're never going to get it from anyway. Hell, that's hell and that's prison, right? There's a, uh, a story um, in, the, in the Old Testament and it talks about the old man, the old prophet, and the man of God. Did you guys ever read this story? It's in uh, Kings. I think it's Kings 13, 14. And it's, it's a very confusing story. This, this man of God shows up and they have the temples this is right after this is jeroboam rehoboam right after solomon his son rehoboam says i'm going to kick everybody's butt if you don't do what i say kingdom splits jeroboam's the king to keep people from going down and sacrificing at jerusalem he builds two temples um one's at bethel and i think the other one's at uh ai i i don't know but it's in it's in it's in the book and uh, <laughs> so he, they have these two temple grounds set up and this man of god shows up and and king, the king Jeroboam's there in the northern kingdom, and he's sacrificing. He says, he starts prophesying about Josiah. He says, Josiah's going to come. He's going to ground these things to powder. 
And um, the king's like, you don't talk to me like that. And he points at him to tell the guards to get him, and his hand crumples up. And, he, and his hand's stuck. And he begs the man of God to pray for him, prays for him, heals him. The king says, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. What is it you want? He says, I don't want anything from you. And he leaves, okay? Now he's supposed to go straight home because God said to him, don't eat anything, don't drink anything. I want you to go here, I want you to do this, and then I want you to go home. That's it, right? So on his way home, an old prophet who's very deceitful um, comes along, hears that this man of God is there, and so he goes and he tricks the man of God and he says, hey, listen, an angel of the Lord appeared to me and he wants you to come back to my house and eat and drink. The man of God says, okay, goes back, believes the man over what God says. <clears throat> While he's at this man's house, the man prophesies his own death. He gets on his donkey to leave. The lion comes out, rips him off the donkey, doesn't destroy the body, doesn't touch the donkey, and all three of them are sitting there, a lion, a donkey, and a dead man of God, right? God said something in relationship to him. And he didn't get to, do you think that was the will of God in the man's life? That if he tore off his, his donkey? No. no. Right? God, God had something else. We probably would have eventually found out this dude's name. Right? God had more for this guy. But God had said something. And instead of in relationship staying with and believing what was said, he believed a man and what a man said. And because of that, his life got cut short. That's very real stuff. Amen. It's very real stuff right Amen. now. People's lives are being cut short. People are not benefiting from anything the scripture says. And there are people in pulpits that are justifying it. And we're believing people. And we're believing what the world has to say. And we're believing um, what psychologists are saying about us when the Bible says something else. And we're not fully taking benefit of what God has said. And I'm going to be talking more about this today, but in the sermon. I like, have you guys ever been to someone's funeral? Mm -hmm. And you sit there and, and um, a great person, love the person and everything. But you knew that you knew that you knew that the full will of God didn't happen in their life. Mm -hmm. Do you guys get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And there's something in us in which we always, like, we'll go to these funerals. And we'll see the person's life. And it'll be kind of set before you. And we say sweet things. And it, 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 they're sweet people. Right? But we know that we know that we know that God had more for them, right? And God's will didn't happen fully in their life to the point that it could have. I'm not saying they didn't have any victories. You get me? But then when it comes to when we think about ourselves, we are so assumptuous in thinking that it's always happening in our life. The will of God, we're not missing it at all. The will of God is always happening in our life. And whatever happens, happens. And that, that's because it's, this was God's will, this was God's will. And, and it's almost like we, we put on a, a blindness to, um, or we romanticize or make our life the movie, right? That everything's going to get redeemed in the end. You guys get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I tell you that because the Bible says a lot of things like be sober, be watchful, be alert. Because you're actually participating in this, this thing called life. And you're actually the participant in this thing in your own life. And your decisions, your perspective, what you do, how much time you pray, getting with God really does matter. And sometimes we're not seeing the fullness of God's will in our life, not because the timing's off, because we're not going after him and his truths enough. You get me? You guys ever done this? Have you ever uh, been less spiritual when things are going well and then more spiritual when things aren't? Yeah? Yeah. Um, you heathens. No. <laughs> um, there's, there's, a, there's a place where, where you, can, you, can, you can get out of that circus and, and you, can, you can decide that you want to fellowship with him because he's worth fellowshipping with. Not because the circumstances require it, but he's actually worthy of your fellowship. It's worthy of much more than your, just your fellowship, but he's actually worth being with. And there's a place, and I hope this, this, these next six weeks get you there. I hope um, that these six weeks would inspire you to take prayer more seriously. Because there's things that we need to benefit from that we're not benefiting from. Or if we are, it's, it's some of them. There's more of them. Okay, so this, this, is, this is just interesting. Because um, when Paul starts to talk about identity, he begins to talk about your part in it. <coughs> Hebrews 12.1, Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What's your role in that? 
to set it aside, right? Do you know that you actually can set it aside? There was a time in human history where they could not set it aside. They, they couldn't do this with sin. It was a part of their DNA. But now, in Christ, it's actually possible to set it aside and not be encumbered by it. And it's done in relationship with him. Colossians 3, 5 through 10, it says this, Therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead, that's it, as dead to immorality. What's your part there? To consider means to reckon to account. Know that this is true, that's your role. Earthly body is dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. If you just did a study there and just highlighted the words that is up to you. Did you guys see that? It says, put on the new self, lay aside the old self. <clears throat> That's actually possible to do in Christ. It's not hard. It's not like, uh, how do I get off this, this, these, these Christmas pants that are too tight? You know, it is. It's, it's actually easy to, to lay it off and put on the new self. <clears throat> and the moment you find yourself thinking like the old self, it's very easy just to renew your mind in the moment in relationship with God. Let me say it this way. There's, there can be an insecurity in a person where they don't allow the Holy Spirit to talk to them about anything that's wrong or anything that needs improvement or anything like that. Okay? What I mean is this. The Holy Spirit is, is my leader, my guide, my teacher, right? And he's guiding me into all truth. And there, 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 is a, there is an insecurity that can be present in a Christian where they will not hear any sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Any sort of correction. Do you guys get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I do a lot of correcting as a father. A lot. And if you, you don't want to get to a place where you don't allow the Father to correct you, where there should be some sort of leading and guiding the Holy Spirit, where he's showing you and hinting at you and saying, uh-uh, no, no, nope, that's too far. What you said there, that, was, that wasn't from the right heart. You guys get what I'm saying? Right. And so you're also in a, in, a, in, a, in a process of correction. And I don't want to see anybody take this message, declare it with their lips, and not be in a process of correction with the Holy Spirit. Because that would get you in trouble. Because now, now that is pride. And now your mouth and your life are way off. And it's very incongruent. And that gets you in trouble. Right? You want your mouth and your life, as, as your life gets improved, you, your mouth can improve with your life. Get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying don't stand strong and declare what is true. What I'm saying is don't make boasts about yourself that aren't true yet. Because that's how you rip yourself off. Matthew 7, 17 through 18 says this. Thank God this stuff is true. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. And um, a lot of you guys have heard Dan Muller talk about this. The problem isn't a fruit issue, it's a tree issue. And when the, you make the tree good, the fruit will be good. And what's he, what's he mean by that is that you've got to understand that you've been made good. And when you understand that you've been made good, you'll produce good fruit. Also, wisdom is proved right by our actions. And there, there's another version that says that, um, that is more leading to the understanding of this. What is sown will eventually grow, right? And we will discover what was sown. Time will tell. Wisdom is vindicated by her deeds, which means this, that at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I'm either crazy, and that will be shown, or this identity thing is true. You get what I'm saying? So time will tell. 
And thank God time does tell, because you want time to tell. This is what identity isn't. It's not an optimistic view of oneself, okay? It's, if this isn't um, like, say positive things about yourself so that positive things will happen. It's not that. And I said it's not a level of maturity. A mature believer will believe in identity, but I don't want people to think that there's some sort of line that you cross where you no longer have to be sober or watchful or alert. <laughs> We're called to be sober, watchful, and alert at all times, right? And so the enemy is doing what? He's prowling around like a lion looking for somebody who's weak and lame to, to sick. Now here's someone who's weak or lame. Somebody who thinks they've crossed the line and they don't need to be sober, watchful, or alert anymore. That's the perfect person. Why? Because that person is sleeping on the job and they could be easily ripped away from it, right? I'm not talking about fear. I'm talking about being sober and watchful and alert. So I'm sober and watchful and alert of my own actions, my own behavior, my own words. I'm like, I, I can see it and I'm, I'm aware of it. I'm not, I'm not saying hurtful things to, if I say something hurtful to my wife, I'm very much aware of it, mm -hmm. right? And, and, I, and I'm going back to God and saying, man, that really came out wrong. And, and there's a place in you where I'm not, I don't talk like that. You know, help me, Lord. What, what was I, show me what's going on. This isn't a perspective that one attains through learning. Your whole life, you were taught that how do you learn things? You attend a class, you listen to someone talk, you study the material, and if you study it long and hard enough, then you'll know it. This is not that. You'll really screw yourself up if that's your thinking in Christianity. Christianity is forged in prayer. It's not forged in a classroom. Now, you're supposed to be equipped in a classroom, and there's, there's a place for you to have doors opened up for you to walk through with Christ and discover. That's what I'm hoping this does for you. This isn't a doctrine that one confesses. This isn't just this mere, um, an understanding apart from God that I talk about. And it's not a self-proclamation of I am a son. What I mean by that is, I'm not trying to convince people I'm a son. I can confess that when I'm alone with God. I'm a son, thank you that you're my dad, and that you're my father. But this isn't something that I'm, I'm declaring, trying to convince other people of. This isn't a doctrine or a teaching that I'm trying to teach people this is a this is a this is something I show people you know what I mean I do all my declaring when I'm with him I don't need to do my declaring to you as if I need to convince you that I'm something to feel something <clears throat> make sense pitfalls of identity um, again learning about identity but not living it claiming you believe believe something before you actually do could you imagine if if Moses believed that the promised land was actually the desert and they went into the desert and that's where they settled because they believed that's the land that was given that would be that'd be a rough life there was there was a there was there was a land that had the buildings built that was lush that had vineyards that they didn't plant and it was all set up and if they would have gave up they would have never gotten there if they would have declared they were there before they got there they would have never gotten there i think oftentimes we can end up doing that where we end up um, declaring we're there in maturity before we are, and then when you do that, you never get to become mature because you stop the process. The Holy Spirit can't take you someplace that you already believe you are. Okay? Now I believe I've been made holy, pure, and blameless, and there's something in my spirit and something in my soul in which he has washed clean, and that old DNA isn't there any longer. But I have, I have no um, weird notions about this mind still needing to be renewed in an ongoing process in which I'm engaged with him. In. Does that make sense? So I understand that I, I, uh, my behavior is growing more Christ-like, but I'm certainly not done yet. <coughs> Confessing identity with your lips in pride and arrogance, still choosing to sin without humility and repentance. Um, God is a, a, he's a, he's a great God, he's a loving God, and he's a holy God. And if there's, if I really cared about him, and if what I did, he didn't like me doing, if I really cared about him, I'd stop. Same thing's true in marriage. If you really loved your spouse and if there's something you're doing that they don't like, if you really cared about them, guess what you would do? you stop. Same thing's true in this relationship with God. Um, the benefits of believing God in, in this area. You get to live life without excuses. Do you know why? Because now all things are possible and you can be just like him, which comes with a price tag and it's no excuses. Because now I don't have an excuse. I have a reason to go fellowship with God and get myself to the place where 
I'm more like him, right? So going back, if, if I find myself short on energy, having a bad day, and my son is really irritating me and my wife's really irritating me, I don't get to say this, which is, and you don't want to say this stuff either. I don't get to sit there and say, I'm having a bad day. Leave me alone. Christ never said that. Do you guys get the ante with this thing? This, this is a no excuses life. There's no excuse for you to say in the midst of this idea, I'm having a bad day, cut me some slack. There's a place in Christ where the day doesn't matter and there's no slack needed. It's a high bar. And I want it to be a high bar because I want to live in a high, high realm with it. Life without problems, but one, a lack of faith. And I, and I love this because um, I don't, in that relationship with God, I don't experience the world um, as most people do. In that relationship with God, there's, there's, there's less problem because there's always going to be less problems when you have less need from people. There's always going to be less problems when you don't need your day to go a certain way to have a good day. You know, and I, I love that about the identity message. I, I love that it's, it's, a, it's a perspective with the cross in front of me all day long where at any point I can go and be thankful and rejoice for the fact that he thought I was worth dying for and that he's made me a new creation and he's done it all. And that's always there right by me to fellowship with. Therefore, the day doesn't really matter because you can't change what took place. That's always true. There's power and authority in it. There's nothing I have that you can take, and there's nothing that you have that I want. You get what I'm saying? So there's not like, um, uh, like if I'm if I'm here and it's like, oh man, I really hope someone tells me I did a good job in this teaching session. You know what I mean? And like everybody's walking out like, see you later, see you later, see you later. How'd you how'd you think that went? Do you think that went? You went? <laughs> it, it's not it's not there. Thank God, right? And there's it's not needed. But there's nothing and like and I love this because how many of you guys know that there's manipulative people out there? Amen. There's nothing left to manipulate. I don't need your approval. Therefore, I you can't string me like a dog after you. There's nothing that you have that I want. There's nothing that I have that you can take. And so manipulation's done. Is not good news. No longer need of affirmation. Don't need to be treated in certain ways. Your feelings and thoughts don't dictate your day anymore. Thank God. And we'll get to that. We'll have just one whole class on that. Um, clearer conscience, more sincere faith. Whenever you get with God, let me say it this way. Whenever, whenever, you're, whenever you're getting with God on a more daily basis, um, and... and your conscience sees that. Your conscience knows that you really want him. And, and there's just something about having a clearer conscience that just helps you to hear more from him and fellowship more with him mm -hmm. in those times. So when you're really, really engaged, and this is really what you want, and you're saying no to the world and what it has, and you're saying yes to God and everything he has, your conscience sees that, and it, it gets really good at what it's supposed to actually do. And it's supposed to help you with that clear line of communication with God. Better communion with the Father, more sincere faith, which is a um, not a hypocritical faith. Your confidence in Christ increases. Your humility increases with the possibility of being like Him. I told you about that. Repentance increases, and hearing from God increases. The reason why repentance increases is this: is because repentance is always going to increase whenever you're engaged with the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is going to point out where you could be more like Him. And so you simply say, you're right, I don't want that, I want what you have for me, you know, which is, which is good. Um, does anybody have any questions? <coughs> yes. As you, you, you were talking about feelings, and yeah. um, I know that you've said they don't always come from me. Yes. The enemy can make you... Yeah hear things and feel things. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as you're growing in this identity and grasping newer realities, yeah. could he come in at those moments to make you think that you're not? Well, this is this is this is Or is that happen. just your own um, thought? Your thoughts your thoughts of where you are are at in the process don't matter as much as your life in the process. You, you know what I mean? Okay. And so the enemy 
will, um, there's a big difference because the Holy Spirit can point out what you did wrong and the enemy can point out what you did wrong. Yes. The Holy Spirit's leading and guiding you to a better place. The, the enemy is, will take you and put you in the dirt and leave you there, you know, and make sure that you don't get up. And so it's not, it's not hard to, to, in your, typically, the, the enemy can't disguise himself as the Holy Spirit very well because he doesn't have self-control. And he'll start stomping on your face eventually with what happened. And you're like, wait a second. This Holy Spirit doesn't stomp on my face. You, you know what I'm saying? And so it's, it's very easy, on the one hand, to feel guilty. But the first thing the Holy Spirit does is lead you to repentance. And so in the moment when you're like, oh, yeah, that's what I want. I want, I want that higher place that you have for me. You're right. That's not the way I am. The enemy would say, look what you did. Look what you did. This is who you are. Yeah. In that. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, there's there's an honest place to look at where your faith is based on how you're how you're how you're living, but again, that's still redemptive. But the Holy Spirit isn't going to want to leave you there with how you've been living. He wants to take you to a higher place in Christ. You know. Anybody else? There's one that. Here's the assignment for next week. I'm going to set it right here. Um, it's simply you're uh, you're reading Romans. <laughs> You're looking at Romans 7, highlighting and making any points in Romans 7 that seems to contradict Romans 6. Bring questions. Um, and also, just for yourself, just listing any, any behavior <laughs> that, that, that the Holy Spirit or has pointed out that, that he wants to change in your life. You know, because every behavior is linked to, to what you believe. Right? Okay. So let me go ahead and close the prayer. Father, I just thank you for this whole group of people. I just thank you for what it is that you've done in the redemption of our lives. And Father, I thank you that we can take advantage of it more. And that's what we want to do, God. We want to be more like you. And Lord, we just bless every person <coughs> in this room that we would fellowship more with you in the, in, the, in the next part of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.